you. Uh, really excited for the PhilDev Summit. Uh, this is going to be an amazing week. We're going to cover all kinds of things. Um, what I wanted to do in this section is to just, while we have this time together, I wanted to just spend a bit of time going through things that all of us kind of already know, some things that some of us know but not all of us know, and a bunch of things that we all really, really care about. So I wanted to just rehash a bunch of this stuff so that we go into a lot of the discussions today, tomorrow, and the next day with all of this fresh in our minds. So I'm going to blaze through a lot of things um, that are, will be familiar to you. Then I'm going to walk us through a very interesting exercise in visualizing the future, visualizing the future success of Filecoin, uh, just to align us on what we're shooting for. Uh, and then after that, we're going to walk through some examples of how you go from that kind of um, exercise into protocol improvements, how you break down those kinds of thoughts into um, concrete ideas for how to evolve the protocol. Uh, cool. So let's go through it. So it's, it's a short talk, only three sections. <laughs> uh, so the Falcon mission and vision, we're going to go through that. We're going to go visualize success, and then we're going to work backwards from that. So the Falcon protocol is a very large system. It has all kinds of components in it. It has a blockchain. It has a decentralized market. It's building decentralized storage cloud. It has an app platform. It builds a decentralized economy. It has a broader ecosystem. All of that gets pulled together into a large-scale open service, and it's all mediated, mediated through protocols, networks, and so on. And this is the mission of Falcoin, to create a decentralized, efficient, and robust foundation for humanity's information. Uh, I've given some talks in the past about what each of these sections is for, uh, and I figured I would do that again here together. And um, somebody recently was pointing out, like, hey, where did this mission come from? And just, like, I'm, I just don't know where, where, uh, um, where this has come from in the past. And I saw some FIPS talking about how, like, oh, data storage seems to be, like, added on to Falcon. It's like, no, no, hold on, hold on. From the very beginning of Falcon in 2014, when I put up the first website of Falcon and the first V1 white paper, Falcon was already about data storage then. It's not about hardware. It's not about empty capacity. It's not about bogus data. It's about valuable, useful data for the world. So, um, so a lot of us, uh, Falcon kind of started in 2014, but then a lot of us took a side quest into making IPFS for many, many years. Um, that was a big crypto winter at the time, so uh, we're pretty focused on building IPFS and growing it and so on. Uh, then in 2017, we revamped the entire protocol, now with a much larger team. Um, we redesigned the whole thing. So little did you know that the Falcon you're using today is actually Falcon V2, not V1. Uh, and around then, in a bunch of the discussions uh, that we're having and the uh, documentation and so on, uh, we went very deep into um, Falcon being for data storage. There's all kinds of like uh, vision talks and documents and whatnot. Uh, you can see it all over the websites that we were made uh, along the way. You can go back to the Wayback Machine, and it all talks about uh, data storage and data storage markets. Um, and this uh, great document that we're going to go through in a moment, uh, the Falcon mission, um, was added to the, uh, to the FIPS repo uh, before the Falcon launch. And a lot of that comes from distilling a bunch of those documents from uh, earlier on. So a lot, of the, a lot of the same kind of ideas and language can be found throughout the years. And since then, of course, there's an enormous amount of articles and videos and so on uh, all talking about this. Uh, I thought it was cool to like, see the, the timeline visualized uh, this way. Uh, cool. So let's go into each section of the Falcon mission uh, in detail. So why decentralized? Um, why do we need a decentralized storage network? Uh, and kind of what, what do we mean by decentralized? What we want is a network that is not controlled or dependent on any one party, that is a, a self-standing structure on the internet based on cryptoeconomic incentives that can organize a large scale number of participants into providing an open service. No party should be required. Any party could be swapped out, should be able to be swapped out. Um, and no one should be able to control, stop, or censor the network. As long as willing participants meet in the network and want to exchange data, they should be able to do that. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that 
you should store stuff that you don't want to store. That's totally up to you. You should decide what you want to store and what you want to distribute. We also want to make sure that the users and providers are not um, going to be uh, co-opted by really powerful intermediaries. We want to make sure that the networks they're using are uh, strong and secure. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we're using strong cryptographic primitives to make sure um, that those incentives are robust. Uh, so that means uh, making sure that we have cryptographic proofs, uh, verifiability, and so on. Uh, cool. So in, I tended to use a lot of these diagrams in the past with these kind of like um, the kind of traditional malicious and honest uh, uh, diagrams where like in computer security, you tend to draw these little horns on top of computers to like showcase that they're, they're uh, malicious. And, um, and I, I introduced the idea of like having the rational hat, uh, which is like an accountant's hat uh, for the parties that are supposed to be just executing the protocol um, that maximizes the return. Uh, and so the way that you should model the current centralized cloud is that it's, it's not malicious, it's just rational and they're going to do whatever is most effective for their bottom line, which often will be you know, removing, uh, your, um, re removing your access to things, potentially destroying um, old applications they don't want to maintain, um, or uh, giving up your data to some other party that um, pays them more money to, to do so. And what we want to do is we, wanna, we, we can't swap out the rational thing. What we can do is we can introduce cryptography layers in between to force the rational equilibrium to mean protecting our rights. And that's what the entire Web3 decentralized movement is all about. It's using cryptography and cryptoeconomics to introduce a layer of rights in between the providers and the users. Uh, cool. So uh, why efficient? Why is efficient so important in the network? Uh, at the end of the day, we have to provide an efficient service. If we're wasteful, and we, um, in this network, cannot provide um, the service at cost, uh, or as close to at cost as possible, um, if we cannot make it um, extremely cost effective, then it's going to get replaced by something else. Economically, it won't survive if it's much more expensive uh, than other things. Uh, in addition to that, um, we, because decentralization tends to um, introduce more steps, meaning we have to run cryptogra uh, some cryptographic proofs. We are in a decentralized setting, so we have more, um, we have to exchange more messages. We have to somehow pay back that inefficiency somewhere else in the protocol. I'll get back to that, but get back to that later. Uh, we also want to make sure that in, with this efficiency, we can exploit all kinds of available benefits that are, that are there for the network to take that may not be there for centralized parties. So this is something that was extremely successful in the early crypt uh, cryptocurrency networks, where a set of participants were able to um, leverage all kinds of cost reductions that were available to, uh, to them and not available to the rest of the world um, to provide a cheaper service. So that's, that's one example of being able to um, gain some efficiency back through this decentralized market. Um, and we really want to make sure that when storage is being bought or sold and so on, um, it's truly an efficient transaction. So today, we all can point to all kinds of things in the protocol that make it not an efficient transaction. And we have to get there. We have to get the system to be uh, as smooth and simple as a centralized cloud. Um, and clients need to be able to trust that they can get the data back from Filecoin efficiently. So they, if they want to get their data, they can retrieve their data quickly, and they don't have to kind of wait a long time or uh, pay a lot of money to, to like ransom their data back or something like that. Um, we also want to make sure that um, the entire network makes efficient use of natural resources. What does that mean? It means that we don't want to waste energy unnecessarily. If you look at uh, some other cryptocurrency networks, um, for example, uh, like the early work networks like Bitcoin and some of the first um, derivatives of Bitcoin, um, they were based on wasting work to feed into the consensus. It's not exactly wasted, it's, doing, it's being spent securing the network, uh, but it is dramatically more effective to use that work for something useful. And that's where Falcon came from, is to be able to use that to um, provide useful data storage. Uh, so what I mean about natural resources here is that we wanna make sure that the network is efficient in terms of its use of electricity and materials. We want to make sure that the network is the greenest possible storage network on the planet. 
not just the greenest decentralized storage network, the greenest storage network on the planet. If we can do that, then countries all over the world are going to be wanting Filecoin to come into that environment. Um, even recently, in the last uh, week or two, there's been a whole another wave of articles about cryptocurrency networks and the energy waste and so on. Uh, and so this is why things like Falcon Green are so important to, uh, to the protocol. Cool, so let's talk about robustness for a while. Um, wh what do we mean by robustness? First off, the network has to be available. It has to have very high availability, similar to the centralized cloud. You can think of that as like five nines of uptime. Five nines is not actually that much. Uh, it, that's kind of like a, maybe we should kind of really update that to like nine nines or something like that. Um, Good news here is that we actually have been perfectly available this entire time, which is really awesome. Um, actually, maybe that four hours at the right after in 2020, uh, but for the last two years, we've been uh, we've been available, which has been been really awesome. Uh, the robustness here also means that clients should be able to trust the network to keep their data safe. If they add their data to the network, as long as the economics work out, as long as there's a rational incentive to keep their data. Um, those clients should be able to trust the network to keep their data safe. Uh, they should also be able to trust Falcon to serve that data in a bunch of extreme circumstances in the distant future. This is where things like perpetual storage come in and so on. But ideally, it would be great to be able to build a system, a utility, um, that functions kind of like the physical materials, right? Like in, with paper, you can write, a piece of paper, write on a piece of paper and leave it somewhere and walk away and somebody else might come back and discover that later on. Um, digital storage, for the most part, doesn't work like that today. Uh, it tends to disappear very quickly. It'd be really, really great to build that kind of equivalent um, uh, in the network. All kinds of data around the world gets lost, um, either by links breaking, by website rotting, by um, uh, websites deciding to change their layouts, websites deciding to shut down parts of themselves, websites going out of business. Um, Censorship in specific governments, certain uh, materials being uh, being censored out. So it'd be extremely, extremely valuable to make to bring a, a layer of permanence to the entire internet, so that we can have um, our data in the long term, and we can get back that really nice property that once we've said something, once we've written something down, um, it's, it's going to be around. Uh, we also, by robustness, we want to make sure that the network is robust to all kinds of very powerful parties including state level actors. So why is this important? Um, when you, the internet is a global um, network that brings all of humanity together. Uh, it has enabled a, a cross-border collaboration across um, the planet, uh, and a huge part of its success has been in um, enabling humans from many different cultures to exchange ideas, coordinate, collaborate, and so on. And we should be able to defend human rights through that, that structure. We also want uh, robustness against all kinds of um, attacks. So there's many kinds of attackers that might appear, um, either for money or for um, malintent or, or uh, censorship goals or, or whatever, that might want to attack specific participants, might want to attack the substance of the network, and the network needs to be resistant to that kind of thing. Uh, one of the things that would be great to achieve, this is very hard, um, but the early internet was designed for this, um, it would be great to be able to resist massive, mass scale uh, disasters. So the early internet was designed to be able to survive things like nuclear war or some kind of um, catastrophic um, seismic event or something like that, uh, or like long running internet partitions. It would be amazing if Falcon um, would be able to um, survive that kind of thing. Um, right now, I don't think any blockchain is able to do that today, um, but uh, maybe in the future we'll be able to get there. Cool, so that's a lot about robustness. What do we mean by foundation? What, what, what is this kind of foundation word? Um, what we mean by that is that it can be used as a foundation for other things, for other technologies, other applications, for users. It is meant to be a platform upon which you build other things. Um, it should be able to support very data storage intensive applications. It should be able to support other networks. It should be able to support Programs, web apps, dApps, smart contracts, all kinds of things that, that are meant to write and retrieve data from Filecoin. Um, and it should be a trustable and dependable foundation, meaning that if you build your application on Filecoin, it isn't gonna pull the rug underneath you and like dump your application in the future. Um, you should be able to kind of deploy a smart contract and walk away 
and expect that that will continue operating there um, with no no breakages. Um, it should be able to, it should be possible for parties to store long-term information. So think of that archival use case again. Think of being able to preserve long-term information. Um, many, many years ago, um, when I first started IPFS, I remember talking to um, Brewster a lot about this specific kind of thing. It's like, hey, it was kind of a miss in the web originally that it was designed with location address links uh, that are all breakable, and it would be amazing to make the entire web content address so you can archive all of it. And so that's kind of what um, Falcon is sort of getting to. Uh, cool, and so what do we mean by humanities information? Um, so here, we, this is meant to be all-encompassing. This is not meant to mean, um, oh, just a subset that we all agree is really valuable. No, no, it's meant to be the union of what all of us think is valuable. So this is meant to include um, all of the information that we, that we care about as, as a species. Uh, and of course, it should certainly be, be sure to include the stuff that we all really, really care about. So all kinds of things like public knowledge, scientific papers, history, the public record, all of that should be able to be preserved with very high replication factors and, and so on. Uh, we want to make sure that Filecoin is good and successful for all kinds of uses. Um, so when a normal developer, a norm normal user wants to store their data on, on the internet, Filecoin becomes the first choice. We're very far away from that today. Um, there are some parts of it that are starting to work that way. Um, certain on-ramps have succeeded in, in enabling this, but we're still very far away from uh, succeeding on that, on that mission. By the way, that's fine. I'll get to why that's okay later. It turns out that uh, technological revolutions take a while. Um, and it would be really, really great for this entire network to become the kind of like digital storage locker for the entire, um, for, for all computer users. So think of it as kind of like, you know, you have your local computer and you have the remote computer in the cloud and that should be, that should be Falcon. Um, cool, so that's, uh, the mission of Falcoin, to create a decentralized, efficient, and robust foundation for humanities information. So can I, like, yeah. Uh, by the way, thanks, thanks to all of you for contributing so tremendously to this, this mission for so, so many, so many years. So huge round of applause for all of you. Cool. Um, I wanted to kind of blaze through a couple of um, other things just so they are fresh in your mind as you go into, uh, into this week. Um, uh, last year, we kind of started framing um, three big uh, work streams in terms of three steps in this kind of broader uh, master plan. Step one, to build the world's largest decentralized storage network. And we've um, basically accomplished that by building um, a massive scale, um, you know, 10 exabyte scale um, network. We then, after that, want to onboard and safeguard humanity's data onto that network. Uh, we've been very hard at work on that. We've been scaling all, all the data um, onboarding into the network. There's an enormous amount of effort that has gone into this. Uh, lots of on-ramps have been involved, lots of specific storage providers, lots of clients, lots of conversations. Um, we're bringing on a lot of super, super valuable data into the network. Uh, we also want to make this retrievable. We're still, we, we've made a lot of progress in that direction. So a long, long road, road to go. And step three is to bring compute to the data. So that means once the network has um, the data, uh, users should be able to run computations on that data and to r build their applications and so on. Uh, so that uh, is sort of breaking down into three different um, sub-components. One is the FEM to bring compute into the chain itself. Um, very excited to say that you know, since we started talking about this last year, the FVM has shipped, and it is now in the network. Huge kudos. Uh, the second part of this is to enable large-scale computation to happen around that data. Uh, and this is likely to happen through a set of compute over data networks. I uh, think of them as L2s running on top of Falcoin. Uh, and then we also want to scale the chain itself. We want to be able to make the chain um, get to a, a hyperscale. Uh, we'll talk more about that in, in a bit. Um, but we want to be able to do billions or trillions of transactions per second, which is a lot. It's a very large number compared to the rest of the chains. Um, but but we, we think that this is a, 
a key advantage that's going to make Falcoin uh, much more successful. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Falcon economy because this is going to be present in all of your conversations. Uh, just remember that the Falcon economy is an ex you can think of it as an export economy. Um, think of it as an economy of participants that um, come together and transact in a in a shared currency. You buy and sell goods and services in that currency. You grow the value within the, that economy by um, using that, that currency in those transactions. So for example, storage providers charging for storage in Filecoin, um, the chain charging for transaction processing in, in Filecoin, or any participant charging for any other good directly in Filecoin. The more transactions we can start operating directly in native fill, the more that economy is going to grow. In addition to growing the value of the economy, you can also import value into the economy. And that's when you take a good and service in the economy and you sell it to somebody else in the world uh, for Filecoin. That means other participants are exchanging some other currency for Filecoin and bringing that value into, into the economy. Uh, you can also export value out, uh, which means when participants are exchanging Filecoin for other currencies in order to pay for your costs, like CapEx and OpEx and so on, um, in, which you need to do in order to grow, um, that is on exporting value out. So you can think of the economy changing um, in terms of growth when newly produced goods and services are bought and, and sold for Filecoin. It'd be great to be able to like grow food and uh, housing and so on and, uh, and whatnot in native Filecoin, but that's we're a long road away from crypto being that pervasive. Um, the economy also grows when exports are greater than the imports, and the economy shrinks when the exports are um, smaller than the imports. Uh, now, because we're in crypto winter, the last three, like the last two years or so, have been uh, this kind of shrinking uh, behavior of exports incre uh, uh, outpacing the imports. And that's because we're not able to, as a whole community, charge more for the services we're offering to the rest of the world than we need to, keep, to um, pay for our costs. Um, I'll talk about that more in a, in a moment. Cool. So let's talk about kind of like the Filecoin businesses. There's a bunch of different businesses across um, the, the network, but, it, but in general, they kind of fall into a, a few segments that the network helps mediate. Uh, and, and these are like, actually, I picked, I picked four, um, missed one in, in this slide, um, but there's you know, more. These are kind of like the four main ones that I want to focus on. Uh, the first one is the Web3 storage market. So this is uh, a fairly small segment, uh, but it's a very important one. So this is all the... the normal uh, crypto native applications. So this is, think of like static assets, like application front ends, NFTs, off-chain data, chain storage, data availability, all this kind of stuff. In terms of raw data storage, this is quite small. Um, you know, probably under two petabytes. Maybe five if you're like being generous with how you're compressing it. Um, but it's basically very, very small. Now, this is a very valuable segment uh, for a couple of reasons. One. Uh, we expect the Web3 and crypto world to grow, and we expect a lot of those applications to, um, over time, uh, become very, very large uh, and very, very valuable. So we want to make sure that we win in that market uh, to grow with the rest of the world. Uh, but we can't count on that market alone, um, uh, paying for all of the network, because uh, it's just a very tiny market, unfortunately. Now, the second reason this market is uh, interesting is that each of these um, operations it's happening in a chain where the resources are heavily constrained, and we might be able to um, charge at a much higher level than in the rest of the world. So for example, in, um, in a chain like, like Ethereum or something like that, um, you pay a huge amount of gas to clear a transaction in the chain uh, because that block space is really valuable. Uh, things like data availability networks for L2s in Ethereum might be extremely valuable um, uh, components where the Falcon network might be able to sell at a very high um, markup relative to you know, the cost of that storage. So this is why this market is also potentially really interesting and really valuable. Um, we haven't yet productized this as much, uh, and perhaps we should. Maybe this was a miss in the last year or two, um, and we should be really focusing on building these specific networks that um, try to productize that. Um, we have a number of on-ramps, things like Web3 Storage and F2 Storage and Lighthouse and so on. Um, but I think none of, none of the ones that I've seen are yet kind of charging in crypto at a very high volume to other smart contracts. And it'd be great to see that sometime in the next few months. <clears throat> uh, 
data availability is particular, particularly interesting one because uh, this is going to become a bigger and bigger problem for the rest of the Web3 space. And, that, and we're perfectly equipped to solve that entire problem for everybody. So we could, sell, we could solve that problem for the entire blockchain world um, and then make Filecoin um, the kind of main data availability layer that everybody uses. Cool. So the next segment, um, which is the, is the most important one, um, in, in kind of like the, uh, in, in sort of in the long term, um, this is what we call today kind of the Web2 storage market segment. Um, and that by that we mean like everything that's not Web3. <laughs> So really, like the vast majority of the data out there in the world. Um, and specifically, we've been focusing on a few segments of that, of the rest of the world, um, that we can handle well, um, primarily cold storage and archival, uh, things like scientific data sets, government data sets, and so on. Uh, we're now, as retrieval gets better, we're going to be able to expand that into things like hot storage um, and object storage, um, but that's not quite, um, not quite there yet. Uh, this is also being supported by a lot of different different on-ramps. Uh, we've seen an enormous amount of success uh, in the last year uh, scaling the, the on-ramp here. Um, and I wanted to dive into this one a little bit deeper as to why it's so important um, and also how to think about winning in this market. So the reason it's critical is that most of the data in the world is in this segment. And so we have to start chipping away at that and start bringing it into, um, into the network. We have to do all kinds of things in order to be able to um, make Falcon successful for the rest of the world. If we just were to focus on Web3, we would be waiting probably a decade or two before those applications were actually at the scale of the rest of the, of the market. So in order to make Falcon successful, we have to cross the chasm and bring the data from the rest of the market into, into this environment. We can't just lean on the kind of early adopter innovator types uh, in, our, in our segment. Um, so there's this really useful model for how to think about innovations like this. So um, you can think of disruptive innovations um, as a class of technologies or products that come into a market that is already kind of saturated with incumbents, uh, bringing a, a set of new features and a big cost reduction. And, and the key component here is a set of new features, new keyword new there, that you know hard to copy things that the other incumbents can't easily do, and a cost reduction. It's not either or. You need both. Uh, and the key thing here is that the new features um, give you an advantage over the incumbents in terms of something that the other parties can't quite do um, or is not in their, in their nature to do. This is where things like the hard verifiability, the proofs, um, the uh, commu community-oriented oriented data set ownership, uh, the smart contracts, all of those features are, are really interesting and really valuable to, to a subset of users. But they're still new features. They're not you know, kind of make or break things that people truly switch away from traditional incumbents. That's where the cost reduction comes in. So in disruptive innovation, you, you want to bring a huge cost reduction to start eating away the market from the bottom, um, bottom up. Um, you can see here the trajectory of the cloud. The cloud did this to on-prem um, data storage and on-prem computing in the past. And it took the cloud about 20 to 30 years to do this. The early cloud started in the 90s with things like um, virtual machines and you know, the whole layers of virtualization and the huge data center build out and so on. Um, I learned recently that Salesforce was actually way older than, than um, AWS or Google Cloud. Uh, and they actually started doing cloud applications and um, they actually had the App Store name. They had trademarked the App Store way before uh, iOS. It was the iPhone. It's a funny, funny story. Uh, but it took about until like, you know mid 2000s uh, for the cloud to really get into the late stage products that we know and use today. So that's about you know 15 years from the beginning to when when the cloud uh, really kind of went into full swing. And a key piece here is that the cloud. Ha had feature sets that were new and different from on-prem systems, but they afforded a huge cost reduction uh, in terms of you not having to um, run your own systems or have to hire your own uh, staff to be able to run the thing and, and so on. And so that cost reduction enabled the cloud to start chipping away at the market and over time overtake the on-premise market. And as they were able to take more and more and more market share, uh, they were able to move up that cost graph into the more uh, expensive, higher premium services. 
Uh, so you, these kind of disruptive innovations have to start in a lower cost environment, and then from there grow into, um, into the higher, higher cost. So you can think of um, the decentralized cloud that way too. And you can think of like starting the clock in 2010 or something like that. So we have about 20 to 30 years to like do effect this transition. Um, and in this time period, we have to have key features that the rest of the market can't easily copy. Um, and we have to have a huge cost reduction. So that's where things like the subsidy and, and Falcon Plus come, come from, is to enable that kind of um, advantage to be able to beat the, the, rest, of the, um, beat the rest of the market. Cool, so um, now I'll talk about the next segment, which is Falcon applications. Uh, you, this is the, the most familiar one to people in blockchains, that this means just any smart contract that spends some gas in the network. Uh, we've now enabled this through, through FEM. Um, remember that this is a huge segment, like most blockchains out there are just, just have this, nothing else, right? Like all of Ethereum is just that. Uh, all of you know, Avalanche and Cosmos and Solana and so on, all they're doing is that single one. If we can make a pretty good chain relative to the other ones, um, that, that becomes a really nice additional component. Um, I don't think we should focus on it, or my view is that we should not focus on this too much um, because we have much better areas uh, to have comparative advantages um, and because we want to be helpful to all of the other blockchain ecosystems and grow together. Um, we, shouldn't be, we shouldn't get caught up in like the dumb tribal fight of the blockchain ecosystem um, because that's kind of like a race to the bottom. You're just fighting over like the same few applications. Instead, you should be helping each other to grow the application stack, to grow the utility, to grow the, the kinds of applications people build. Um, and then the last one that I wanted to highlight is just L2s. These are kind of applications, but they're much more significant. When you build an entire new network on top of another network, you bring a, a large scale ecosystem along with you, and that becomes dramatically more valuable. This is what sets something like Ethereum apart from, um, from other networks. Being able to have those entire like, L2s um, contributing and being part of that economy is extremely, extremely valuable. Uh, so this is where things like um, filling out, com uh, completing pieces of the, um, the cloud storage or cloud compute landscape uh, come in. You can do, do things like CDNs as L2s. You can do things like uh, data prep markets as L2s. You can do things like um, aggregators as L2s. So you can do all kinds of things as, as L2 networks. Um, and of course, you can do all the compute over data things. Th those are going to be uh, fairly large and significant. It's going to take a while for them to, uh, to get going. But becoming the best home in the entire um, world for those compute over data networks would be extremely, extremely valuable. And of course, you can think of many other kinds of L2s that people build in other, in other blockchains. Um, there's, there's going to be a whole range of applications and systems built um, with their own chain. So think of entire virtual worlds or games um, or, or large scale data processing applications all built with their own kind of sub chains. And you want all of those to be homed, um, or you know, as many as possible, uh, to be homed in, in Falcoin. So coming back to this kind of Falcoin economy world, um, if you want to kind of grow the value of the economy, you either transact more in direct Falcoin, or you figure out some other um, uh, components, some other businesses um, to be able to um, tap into. And so that means like either build an L2 or build more Falcon applications or scale the, the data onboarding in, in the storage market um, for Web2, or um, figure out these kind of like Web3 storage market components and see if you can kind of upsell that. The, the cost reduction one is, is tricky here because if, if we have to give a cost reduction to the rest of the market and try to bring in value into the, into the network, that's kind of like the margin is just not very large there. And so that's kind of a pain point. Um, and so we have to kind of bridge this with the, with the whole kind of menu of options. Cool, let me pause there. Uh, how long was that? <laughs> okay, cool. I think maybe we, I, will not, um, I will not take over your lunch uh, and maybe I'll say visualizing success until later. Oh, I have 15 more minutes. Oh, you gave me an hour. I spent an hour and he'll be here for Yeah. <laughs> Smart. Uh, how about, since I've been blathering for a very long time, how about everybody uh, stands up briefly, stretches, uh, 
I definitely run on a slower clock when I'm tired. <laughs> All right. All right, that was our stretch break. Uh, we're gonna get rolling on this really quickly. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna visualize the success of Filecoin in the future. We're gonna think five years in the future, 10 years in the future, and 15 years in the future. And we're gonna do it by looking at a few questions. Can everyone read this roughly? It says the number of people using the internet, the number of devices in the world, the number of HTTP requests per day, the number of data objects, and the total amount of data stored in the world. So let's, let's try and like es broadly estimate what does that look like. So uh, my favorite search engine, Google Images, has a great resource uh, where you just type in the question that you want, and you add diagram at the end, and you get amazing results. Um, for example, you get all these like gray graphs from reports, things like, um, you know, the rough amounts of users, um, the internet users and so on. And you can roughly interpolate between these graphs um, how many people are using the internet today, um, kind of safe estimates across a bunch of these graphs. I looked at like 10 more than three. Um, it's roughly around 5.3 billion people on the internet today. Seems to be growing at about like 300, 5.3 billion people. Um, it seems to be growing at around like three to 400 million a year. Um, and so we can sort of safely estimate that we're going to hit about 5.6, 5.9, 6.2 billion um, over the next um, 15 years. Uh, let's think about the number of devices in the world. This one is way trickier. There's a the estimates range a lot. Um, but you can roughly get to, you can interpolate between a bunch of these figures to land on about 30 billion devices in the world. That to me seems like a low, low bound, actually. I think there's a lot more. Um, but I wanted to kind of lean on the graphs that were there. Um, and if you, um, I, I started introducing this 10% graph at the bottom, just keep remembering that, um, because if we want to, say, have 10% of the market share of cloud storage on the world, um, which seems like a pretty good, ambitious target to shoot for, um, that means 3 billion devices need to be transacting <laughs> with Filecoin uh, this year. And as that number grows, that number, that 10% number grows quite a bit. Um, this is growing up at a pretty alarming pace, um, probably going to close to double by 2038, according to, the, to these estimates. Uh, the bulk of it is IoT, enterprise IoT. That's where most of the devices are being built. So think of like all of the um, computerization of um, all kinds of systems. Uh, number of HTTP requests per day. This was way harder to find. Um, didn't find like really good estimates anywhere. Nobody likes, no CDN out there likes giving the numbers. Um, and so I kind of pieced it together from a set of things, things like the number of Google searches per day, things like the number of YouTube views uh, in a day, things like the number of visits to various websites. And then you can sort of like multiply by some like expected number of HTTP requests. And here I was generous and basically called, you know, one single <laughs> page load a single HTTP request, when in reality there's probably like 100 these days. Um, but anyway, you end up with like something like 100 trillion, 100 tera requests per day. Um, and 10% of that is 10 trillion requests per day. So that's a lot. That's how many retrievals would be happening on Filecoin today if we had 10% of the cloud storage market. That is a hell of a lot. So when you estimate how many uh, retrievals we can serve through storage provider inf infrastructure, through retrieval provider infrastructure like Saturn, uh, we have to be like having these kinds of numbers in mind because we want to shoot for this. Now, we're not at 10% today. Um, we have to grow into that, uh, but we want to be able to design protocols that shoot for this kind of scale. Uh, we don't want to design protocols that can't possibly reach this scale. Um, an example of doing that is Falcon V1. Uh, Falcon V1, when we first designed it, uh, we didn't calculate certain parameters, and um, scaling to certain sizes of data storage like, I think adding a few exabytes of data into Falcon V1 would have used more, more bandwidth than was available in, like, most the inter data center links. So don't do that. Um, instead, uh, design for the goal, uh, which is, like, if we want to hit something like 10 um, trillion requests per day, which, again, I think is, like, a huge lower bound. I think it's just way, way larger than that. 
then you know, think about what the software that we're making needs to do. Think about the scale of the network that we need to have to be able to deal with that many requests. So you know, think about, let's benchmark the current software, figure out how many requests it can do, figure out the bandwidth, and then say, OK, great. Like We have to multiply by that many more machines in order to be able to deal with this kind of request per second. Uh, cool. So what about the number of data objects? So this is, um, thankfully, Amazon does like talking about um, how many objects they have. And that, I, that was like a very neat, very nice number. Uh, they claim to have about 280 trillion objects in AWS uh, in S3. Um, we can sort of estimate that there's about like 20 systems of similar scale when you think of like the long tail of tiny systems that add up. Um, and you can end up with like some kind of low bound saying that we have about 5.6 quintillion, sorry, quadrillion um, objects. Uh, so that's roughly the number of data objects. So that means like individual references that are all random accessible, that are all tracked, life cycled, created, updated, deleted, indexed, referenced, backed up, all kinds of things. So the deal infrastructure of Filecoin needs to be able to hit this kind of scale. Currently, we use deals for large collections of stuff. But now think of a new type of deal where you're just looking at a single object. Now, this doesn't have to be the traditional storage deal that we're using in poor apps. This could be a different kind of like L2 type of aggregator. But this is the kind of thing that we're shooting for. Like that number of objects. That's a lot. Chain is going to have to scale a lot to get there. Good news on that, though. Um, so now let's talk about total data stored. So um, I actually think the number of data objects is a way harder problem to deal with because of all the metadata uh, than the amount of data. But the amount of data is still really large. <laughs> so most estimates talk about you know in the hundreds of zettabytes being generated, of which we store about um, eight to twenty zettabytes. I took the lower bound number. So there's about eight zettabytes of data stored. Um, and this is neat because you can look at the actual shipments of hard drives and SSDs and tape and calculate it out. Um, and so it's about like that scale of, of data. 10% of that is about 0.8 zettabytes. That's 800 exabytes. It's a lot. So that means that the network needs to be able to grow into that scale. And by the way, look at how that number is growing every, every five years. We need to keep pace with, with the growth of the, of the entire internet. So that means the network needs to be able to onboard that amount of hardware. It needs to be able to onboard that amount of data. It need, so that means like we need way cheaper poor apps. Like the current poor app, it's not going to cut it. We need way better protocols uh, dealing with uh, onboarding into the chain. Uh, we need all kinds of improvements to be able to hit this kind of scale. Uh, so you know this is kind of if you bring back all those numbers, this is kind of like roughly where you where we get. And if you just take ten percent, that's like that's the target that we should be designing for. Now ideally we should design it for the hundred percent, but you know let's pick an easier target um, and build towards that in the next five to ten years. Um, and we want to be on an acceleration curve where we can catch up to the rest of the market and exceed the growth rate and then get to that ten percent. So that means we need protocols that can deal with this kind of stuff. So when you go design things, reason through, is the thing you're designing going to be scalable or not? And if it's not, then maybe design something else. Turns out that building things is so damn hard anyway that if you <laughs> design like a non-scalable thing, you're probably going to spend about as much time or maybe like half as much time as building a scalable one. So you might as well build a scalable one. Uh, that doesn't always hold, but for the most part, I think it holds. Um, now, what kind of data are we talking about? All kinds of objects, right? So hundreds of millions of emails, messages, searches, videos, social media, posts, tweets. They're going to be tweets forever. Snaps, um, whatever, all kinds of messages, applications. Um, think, of, think, of the, think of the stuff that people normally use. Don't think of the stuff that Web3 people use, because that's a very, very small percentage of the people in the world. Think of the big numbers, the things that are consumer-oriented that most of the people in the world use. The traditional social networks, the productivity applications, the media design applications, 
the storage applications, the data science applications, those are the kinds of things that we want to be modeling against and building towards. So we want to build systems that are going to be able to handle that kind of scale. Think about games. This is like the you know, top games in 2020 to 2022. Um, a bunch of these are not online, so they're like easy to move around, big static bundle, move it around, great, done, problem solved. Uh, a bunch of these, though, are online, and especially the virtual worlds ones, that's where there's a super interesting potential for Web3. Because when you make those virtual worlds suddenly have um, persistence and be decentralized, they become much more interesting and potentially much more valuable. Um, there's a number of the game developers building these games are currently working on AAA titles with blockchain tech in them. Um, they're likely going to come out sometime in the next you know, two to three, maybe four years. Um, and right now, they're making decisions about what technologies to use. And it would be great if they're like, oh, shit, of course, Filecoin. Why would you use anything else? And uh, a, something very near and dear to my heart, the scale of the scientific data sets out there uh, is pretty massive, uh, as we've all known. And this is an area where we have a great selling advantage because they, that community really cares about the same feature sets. And it's also very price sensitive, which is perfect for us. That's exactly the market we want to go for. Um, this is the scale of certain experiments. Uh, by the way, it's super awesome that we have the Atlas experiment data on Filecoin. That's just such an important achievement. That's where the web started. It's the biggest data producer on the planet. And the fact that we've already gotten there is a huge accomplishment. So like, huge kudos to everyone who worked on that. All right, and since, um, so I'm gonna like just flash a way, the way that I would kind of approach this, and I'm gonna do the, the full version of this as a separate session, so I, I won't hold you back for lunch. Um, but now that we have kind of like the vision of like what success looks like at scale, um, and by the way, we haven't even taken into account new applications that might emerge, things like the metaverse or other kinds of AI systems or other stuff, like this is just kind of looking at today's markets. What we take, do with this kind of thing is then start thinking about all the kinds of things in the protocol that have to change to be able to adapt to this. Things like how onboarding has to scale, how the rights have to be, how, we should be able to do rights of all different kinds of sizes. We need to be able to do aggregation. We need to be able to have mutable rights. We need to have reads of all sizes. We have, need to have low latencies. We have to have all kinds of storage media, flash, disk, tape, and so on. Um, th the biggest one here is the chain must scale. Um, we need to be able to get to massive scale of computation on the chain. Um, it'd be great to be partition tolerant. And one key thing that we didn't talk about is a bunch of this storage carries deep and heavy regulatory restrictions on how that data must be stored. And so it'd be really great to get those storage certifications um, directly on chain. First, as verifiable claims, because that's really easy, just data structure on chain, sweet. Second, with cryptographic proofs, that would be a great bonus. Don't just like take for granted this certification, check it and have a proof for it. That would be a huge selling point. At that point, suddenly governments start forcing, uh, mandating that you use this kind of technology, which would be super, super cool. Um, great, so I'll, as mentioned, I'll go through this in greater detail, but this is kind of like, a, a glimpse at like the kinds of things that we w should be discussing while we're all here together. New pore apps, different data structures, um, different subnets to aggregate contents, fast retrievability, solving all kinds of problems there, and, and so on. All right, thanks so much. Uh, sorry for blathering at you for like an hour now. Uh, I'll get off the stage and let's go have some food. Oh, sorry, not yet. <laughs> <laughs>